Turn verse 1. It is also on the monitors that you can read it there. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Only one verse this morning. If you have your Bible, maybe someone next to you that does not, it's all right to share. We're family in here. Mom always taught me to share. Amen. So if you have it on your phone, maybe your iPad. And some of us still have the good Bible with the pages as they turn. Amen. And so Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1. And the word of the Lord reads, Wherefore, seeing we also are come to us, a compass about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doeth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning from this subject, removing spiritual clutter. Removing spiritual clutter. Let us pray and ask God to, to help us to receive his word this morning. Father God, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love and your kindness toward us, oh God. We thank you for waking us up this morning, oh God, and starting us on our way. We thank you, Lord God, for your goodness, Lord God. For, Lord God, somebody did not get the same opportunity that you've given us. We give you glory, God. We thank you, Lord God, for this great salvation. I thank you for truth, oh God. Father, I thank you for reading the scriptures this morning, oh God. Right now, you're going to talk to us, oh God. I pray let your glory, Lord, fill this house, oh God. Let your train fill the temple in the name of Jesus. Father, if we came, Lord God, we all came to, Lord God, to hear the word of God. And I came for a change. I know somebody else is here to want to receive a change in their life, oh God. Speak to us right now, God. We ask that you, Lord God, bind every spirit of distraction. I bind it in the name of Jesus. I give it no, Lord God, right to be here in the name of Jesus. For this is the house of the Lord God. This is your place of worship, oh God. And we come to be in your presence, oh God. So I bind the spirit of boredom and sleepiness and slumberness that will try to overtake us right now. Exactly when the word comes forth, oh God. I don't take it lightly, Lord God, when the devil wants to act, oh God. But right now, open up our ears. Hear that as an ear. Let him hear what the spirit is saying to the church. In the name of Jesus, we give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, we pray. Clap your hands up to God right now. Come on, open up your Come on, shout for the voice of triumph. Come on, give God the glory. Let's not be quiet this morning. Come on, wave your hand and yourself thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbors, time to clean up. You may be seated. Can't the spirituals have a song? They have a song that says, You got to clean up what you messed up or what you messed up. Started my life all over again. I like that song. Amen. Amen. And so the topic this morning, it is removing spiritual clutter. Removing spiritual clutter. There is a disorder that maybe some of you have heard of or maybe you know, but it's called compulsive hoarding disorder. Compulsive hoarding disorder. Compulsive hoarding is also named, known as hoarding disorder. It is a behavior pattern characterized by excessive acquisition of an, an, an inability or unwillingness to discard large quantities of objects that cover the living areas of the home or cause significant distress or in pyramid. I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but you can put those pictures up. I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but many people live like this. I don't know if you ever helped anybody of those who ever done community service. When you've gone to try to help many people in the community, and you walk in a house, 
Pam, this is right before you. Now, most of us would be like, uh-uh, uh, that's not my job. I just came to do a little community service, and I didn't come to get involved in all of this. I don't know about you, but if somebody called and asked me to help them move, I'm okay with that. But I don't know about you, but how many of you ever gone to somebody's house? They say, can you help me move? But nothing is packed. So not only are you moving, but you're packing. Not only are you packing, but you're moving. Not only are you doing that, but you're wrapping plates and doing all of that. I didn't come to sign up for all that. I just came to help you move. Amen. It's quiet, so somebody who did that before. Amen. Amen. It's all right. It is a disorder that scientists say over 3 million people struggle with. It is classified as a mental illness. This illness makes a person feel as if everything they possess or have, it is of a significant value to have or to hold on to or to keep. That if you try to get rid of what they have, then it becomes a problem because they're saying, I need that. You ever seen anybody like that? Oh, 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 I, I'm going to need that. But it got spider webs on it, and it's been in the corner. I know, I know, I'm going to clean it up. It's broken. I know it just needs one screw. I, I'm going to hold on to that. I don't know if you know anybody like that. Let me bring it closer to you. I, I know I can't fit that right now, but in a few years, I'm going to lose all of this weight, and I'll be able to put it on again. Don't get it out of your closet and give it to somebody else. But you're holding on to it as if. It is a need that you have. They call it a mental illness. I'm not saying that you're guilty. I'm just saying there's a problem if you do that. This illness, illness makes a person feel as if everything they possess or have is a value. I need this. I got to have this. You can't throw that away. I want this. I want that. And I, I got to hold on to it. And no, don't take it. Don't take it away from me. You have obsessive compulsive disorder. It's a person that means that we literally have panic attacks when you begin to throw things out. You have panic attacks when somebody tells you, throw that away. You have panic attacks saying, listen, that ain't even going to be used for nothing. Why don't you just throw that away or give that away? Well, you have panic attacks saying, no, but I, I need it right now. I'm probably going to need it next year or I'm probably going to need it uh, tomorrow or next week. Someone that asks them to throw things away, then they go into a panic attack. They are so attached to these things or these items that they will get offended when you tell them, let it go. And as a preacher, and as a pastor, I have felt this before. And when you tell somebody, you need to leave that alone. I don't believe that, pastor. I need this. I, I, I got to have this. And, you know, I don't like you telling me I need to give this up. And I, I don't like you telling me to do that. I, 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 it almost seems like they're having a spiritual panic attack. They don't know what to do with themselves. So their unwillingness to declutter or throw things away, they will store things, or these people will store things in their home. And at the end of the day, it becomes unhealthy, unsanitary, unbearable for themselves or others to live in. The things that we have in our life, it becomes unhealthy, unsanitary, unbearable for you to be able to live in it. I don't know about you, but there was a television show called Hoarders. If you've ever seen this show, this show is a real life documentary of people that actually have this problem. And what they would do is they would sit over psychologists or psychiat psychiatrists uh, that, uh, that will try to get them to break uh, this situation or this problem that is in their, their life. There was one episode where there was an elderly lady by the name of Shirley. And Shirley was known for hoarding cats. Cats all up in the home. Cats all over the place. That when they actually went in there to try to look at what was in there, it was seen that they found over 76 cats living in the house. And after they started to remove certain cats, look at the cats in the certain places. 
But when they began to start moving some of the cats out of it, they found a whole lot of deceased cats still living in this place. There was another man by the name of Al or Adam. Adam was a man that had a three-year-old son. He had so much junk in his house and that he would teach his three-year-old son how to go uh, dumpster diving. Really pretty much put the son in the dumpster to go diving and searching for different things that's in the garbage. Different things. And what happened is the county had to step in and remove the son from the house. And so you ask this man, Alan, do you see a problem with this? No. There's nothing wrong with this. We need these things. What they're throwing away is treasure. But really, some of that stuff is garbage. Also in California, California, there was a couple, a couple that had so much stuff in their house and in their basement that they collected so many things that in their basement, they had a homeless woman living in the basement and they did not know she was down there. That's how much junk was in that house. That there was so much junk that somebody is in your basement and you don't even know they live in it. There are many conditions where people are being buried alive. And this may seem hard to believe, but there are people right now here among us and in Bellevue area and Pahokee and South Bay and Canal Point that are living like this spiritually. There are many of us that are living like this spiritually. Holding on to things that we need to let go. But you're hoarding after these things saying, I need it. I need it. I can't throw it away. I can't get rid of it. I, I, I got to have it. I, I, I don't, don't make me do this. And I remember my mother used to do things like, you know, it's time to spring clean. And I hated that because we would get behind baseboards and get underneath stuff and spray bleach everywhere. The whole house smelling like comet and bleach and all of these other things. Pulling mattresses and taking them outside and hitting them and bringing all the dust and all this other stuff. I hated that. But by the end of it, you knew the house was clean. You knew everything but part of that house was clean. The neighbor can have roaches, but right in our house, clean. Clean. I didn't like it. Why? Because there was a process of things that we had to do to get the house clean. And many today are fearing or they are in the place where they have severe case of not letting go of things, both naturally and spiritually. Let me give you this list. Let me give you this list right here. I can't let go of that tired relationship that ain't going nowhere. I can't let go of her. And I, I can't let go of him. Why? He, I think he's a good man. Or I think she's going to be a good wife. Or I think she's going to be good. But God didn't give that to you. But you're claiming this is mine. I can't let it go. Can't let go of those tired friends that don't mean you any good. They, they don't care really too much about your soul, but you still claiming, that's my homie. That's my friend. We tired. But they really don't care about your soul being saved. Hard to let go of family members that really want to keep you out of the will of God. I understand we say that blood is thicker than water, but the only blood that I know that's thicker than anything is the blood of Jesus Christ. And so I have family members that I know that really ain't ready to be saved. You think I'm going to allow them to keep my soul out of, out, of, out of heaven? The devil is alive. I know I want to be saved. I shall be saved. And nobody's stopping me from being saved. So if you want to go ahead and do that, rock on with your past self. Live like you want to live. But this preacher right here, this young boy right here, must be saved. You got people that won't let go. They won't let go of their false churches. They won't go let, let go of their false religion or false preachers. That if you know the scripture based on the scripture, you know for sure that it's not right. They can't let go of their bad habits. They will keep it and they will keep themselves out of what? Out of heaven. You say, what bad habits, pastor? Your attitude, your stubbornness, your laziness. 
Your willingness to say, listen, I don't care. I'll pick it up later. Your nonchalant attitude. This is a bad or a or a bad or old bad habits or habits that we have that we tend to say, that's just how I am. Don't try to change me. That's how I am. Can't let go of our fleshly desires to allow God to be pleased with our life. Well, Pastor, no, don't tell me I got to do that. Or, no, Pastor, don't tell me that I got to give this up. I mean, what's wrong with this? And I'm trying to tell you, I'm not a psychologist. I, I'm not a psychiatrist. But I am a preacher. And what is this preacher doing? I'm telling you what's in the word of God today, this morning. Faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. When you get good preaching, when you get the word of God, when you hear truth, what is it doing? It's like a psychologist or psychiatrist that comes to tell you what you need to do to clean up your life. And I don't know about you, but I needed somebody to tell me what I needed to do to clean up my life. Because everything that was in my life was wrong and it was doing what? Overtaking me. It was killing me. It had me dying every day. But I need somebody to say, son, I need you to get rid of this. You're going to have to get rid of this if you want to stay alive. If you want to make it. If you want to live. If you want to be saved. you got to get rid of all of this junk that is in your life. Somebody got to say, Lord, clean my house. I'm glad that I heard the word of God. And allow me to be able to look over my life and say, so Lord, you said I don't need this? No. I don't need that? Uh-uh. I don't need her? Uh-uh. You know, I don't need him? Uh-uh. Can't do nothing for you. I don't need that? Uh-uh. I'm the one that sustains you. And you can't, I don't need that either. And so when God begins to deal with your life, this is why we have a problem. Because when God comes into your life, this is what takes place. Everything is stripped from you. And this is why you say, I don't really like that church. I don't really like that church. I don't really like that pastor. But it's not me, people of God. It is God dealing with your heart. It is the Holy Ghost. Because what God does when he walks into your life, he strips everything from you. Which means that everything that you came or with, or everything that you have, he says, we won't be needing none of that. None of that he's going to use. So somebody will say, well, you know what, God, I, I think you can use this, though, because what I got right here, this is really good. And God says, I don't need that either. Put it away. We're going to throw that out. By the time you look around, you have nothing. And you say, well, God, what? Well, what, what, what I'm going to do? I ain't got nothing now. I mean, he left and she left and I thought I was going to be doing this and I thought I was going to be doing that and I thought this was going to work out and this was going to be. And God says, no, none of that. We strip it, all of it. This is how God is, people of God. But when he takes it from you, he's going to give you something better in return. I don't understand if you want that, but this is the problem that we have in the Glade area. I'm not from the Glade area. So God will put a preacher that's not from here. Why? Because I have no favoritism in anything. So when he brings me here, he will say, open up your eyes, son, and see what's going on. And when I see what we deal with in Bell Glade is that we take anything that is given unto us. The devil is alive. I don't want a small church. I want a large church. Why? For people to be saved. I don't want no storefront all the days of my life. We need a bigger church now for souls to be saved. We need people to be saved. What we want is these little things. We put up with little relationships where he never wants to be faithful and put a ring on your finger. They never want to do this, but they'll do this and take this. But we can we settle with these things. But God says, get that stuff out of there. I'm going to take it from you. I'm going to strip it from you. I'm going to take it out of from you to give you something better. That's why this preacher is letting you know this city is about to change. This city is about to change. The jobs are coming in. The businesses are coming in. Housing is coming in. And everybody that won't want it, I'm asking God, pull them out the city. Every demon that don't want it, every devil that's trying to stop the will of God, God, pull them down. Pull every false church that want to hold on to the people and take them out of their money. And don't teach them what they must do to be saved. God, pull them out of the city. In the name of Jesus. Tired of people going to church on a Sunday morning. Just shouting out hallelujah, thank you Jesus. And leave it there and there is no change. Ain't telling nobody that they need to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Ghost, not in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. If you have done that, you are not saved according to the Word of God. I ask you what book are you reading? If you're thinking that you're going to church, if you're thinking that you're going to heaven, you and your husband, you and your family, if you have not been baptized in water, submerged in the name of Jesus, your sins are not washed away. You are not saved. If you have not received the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, you are not filled. You do not have the Holy Ghost according to the word of God. But people don't like this. Why? Because I'm pulling your religion from you. Why? Because I'm pulling your traditions from you. Why? Because I'm pulling that false preacher out from your life. Why? I don't like that. I don't like this order. I don't like peace and that order. I don't like this. I don't like this. But when God comes in, the first thing he does is set things in order. And so that's why the scripture text tells us in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 through 2 let's read it one more time. It says wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness. Let us do what? Lay aside of your weight. These things you're holding on to it's a weight. It's what's keeping you from doing what you need to do. You remember how you had a heart or desire to want more of God. You remember how you had a desire when you wanted truth. You remember how you had a desire to want to be at a church. But now you don't show up at all. But now you don't have a praise for God at all. But now your attention is somewhere else. But now you can't do what you need to do for God because why? You're distracted. But notice what it says. Lay aside every weight. And the sin which don't see easily beset us. And let us run with patience. The race that is set before us. And look what verse 2 says. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finish of your faith. God is asking, do you want to finish the race? He's already finished it, but he's telling you, do you want to finish it? All you got to do is say, Lord, I want to finish it. Help me to finish it. Because God says, it is finished. It is done when he hung his head. He said, it is finished. It is done. He's already finished it for you. The question is, do you want to finish it? Do you want to finish the race? I want to finish the race, God. Get me across the finish line. Get me across the finish line. Help me to finish this test. If you're going through something this morning, ask God to help me finish the test. I don't want to bear that right now, God. I'm thinking about suicide. I'm thinking about depression. I'm thinking about oppression. It has a hold on me, but I want to finish. Tell God right now this morning, I want to finish. Talking to somebody in the Holy Ghost. Somebody is getting this right now. Somebody is going through. That's why you're crying. That's why you're hurting. That's why it's touching your heart. That's why you got the goosebumps. Because God is talking to you. It ain't goosebumps, it's the Holy Ghost. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy. That was set before him and do the cross. That means he went through something, people of God. Despising the shame. Who cares what you think? Who cares what you think about my worship this morning? Who cares about what you think about my praise when I stand up and lift up my hands? You didn't die for me. And you ain't going to be able to do nothing for me. Well, go ahead and laugh on and rock on with your bad self. But I'm going to praise my way through the finish line. I'm going to keep my eyes upon Jesus. And I'm going to raise my hands in the name of Jesus. And I'm going to keep walking and hearing his voice because he says, My sheep, they know my voice. Come on, daughter, keep walking. Come on, son. Son, keep walking. Come on, people of God, keep walking. And keep your eyes upon Jesus. Don't you allow that devil to get you distracted. Don't turn to the left or the right. Because these are the things that are distracted. Keep your eyes upon Jesus. And keep walking towards him. Keep walking towards the prize. And press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. Somebody need to say, I got the press. Come on, somebody, you got the press. Press your way through this thing. Press your way through this thing. I'm preaching already. Press your way through this thing. In the name of Jesus. Somebody call on Jesus right now. Despising the shame. And it's set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So this morning, let me give you these three points. And not only will you receive them here, but you will take them back home with you. That you will hold on to these things. That God is talking to you. Many of us have said, Lord, would you just give me a word? Will you just talk to me? But let me tell you how God does it, people of God. It's not 
the way that he would do it back in the day when he did it in an audible uh, talking to the man like Moses. It's not so much like that today. Not to say that God can do that, but what the way God talks to mankind today is through the word of God. So when you want God to talk to you, just open up the book and begin to read. And watch how much stuff that he talks to you about. Watch how much stuff that he shows you. Watch how many things and answers, questions that you have. He'll begin to reveal the answers to everything that you have. That's why this is a two-edged sword. It appears that you're going to divide it It is a discerning of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God knows exactly what's on your mind and what's on your heart right now. But just when you listen, take a heed to it and listen to what he says. When he diagnoses you and he lets you know what it is, begin to say, okay, Lord, now give me the medicine. Give me the antibiotics. Tell me what I need to do. Tell me who I need to get rid of. Tell me what I need to let go. Tell me what I need to clean out. And don't hold back. Get it out as fast as you can. So number one, the struggle is real. Tell your neighbor that. The struggle is real. I know it's real. People say, man, the struggle is real, man. I'm going through, man. I understand, yeah, the struggle is real. It's a real deal. I'm not trying to belittle what you're going through. And don't let nobody do that. But once you find out, yes, it is real. But I'm telling you this, God's word is more real than that. You hear what I'm saying to you? God's word is more real than that. So when you say, Lord, I'm broke, God says, no, no, uh -uh, you're not broke. You're rich in me. That's how you got to say, you say, Lord, I'm sick. Uh -uh, by my stripes, you are healed. So now whose word you going to believe? You going to believe God or you going to believe somebody else's? I'm just going to believe God. I'm just going to believe God. You say, well, Lord, I'm lonely. He said, uh, I'll never leave you, never forsake you. Who told you that? Where are you getting this stuff from? Who's talking to you? Stop going to the club. Stop doing your little dance. Stop doing that stuff and won't you praise God to the real music right here. To the real music. Why don't you stop listening to some of these R&B songs that's making you feel down like you're so lonely. Stop listening to this blues. Stop listening to this garbage. Stop listening to this stuff. Stop listening to that mess. Stop putting on earth with the fire and put on some God music. Put on some God for music. Come on, let's go back. Take me back, God. Take me back, God. Let me listen to something that's going to lift up my spirits. Don't have me walk right and talk right and act right. Come on, somebody clap your hands out of that. So the struggle is real. The question is, why is the struggle with me? Why, why God, I mean, why am I struggling? Well, John 10 and 10, you've heard it before, but I don't know if we really understood what we read. The thief, or the devil, Lucifer, Bezalel, that liar. Look at the scripture, you can call him what you want to call him, that serpent, that devil, whatever you want to call him, that thief, cometh not, but to do what? To steal. I'm stealing everything that you have. Your joy, your peace. I'm stealing your family members. I'm killing them. I don't care about you or nobody in your household. I know if somebody was telling you that in your face, you'd be ready to fight. But you're fighting the wrong person. You need to fight the devil. And call in the blood of Jesus. And rebuke him and bind him. But the Bible says you got to submit yourself. You got to submit first. And then you will do what? Then the devil will flee from you. You got to submit, people of God. You got to submit first. Submit to the will of God. Submit under the Lord mighty authority of God. Submit to the Holy Ghost. Submit to what the Bible says to do. When you submit, that devil can't fight you. Because he understands you are under authority. I'm submitted. That means I have a covering. That means if he tries to hurt me, he has to try to go in God. And he can't be God. Because God has already defeated him. You got to understand this devil is working for God, people of God. Don't you understand that? It ain't like Jesus and God. Come in, sir. It ain't like Jesus and God up here and they fight and trying to do this and tussling and doing all of that. God ain't doing that with the devil. God has made the devil. God made the devil. He created Lucifer and he put Lucifer upon his feet. He kept him out of heaven. So why are you struggling with this devil? He's already defeated people of God. Don't you understand? He's already defeated. But you're still thinking that he has control. He has no control except what God has given him to do. But if you come to mess with me, devil, I understand it's for my good that at the end of this thing, I shall overcome. I ain't talking about no Negro spiritual. I'm talking about the word of God. 
Jesus says, I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. So notice what Jesus says in verse 11 and 16. Make it simple. Look at what it says in verse 11 through 16. It says, I am the good shepherd. I don't know about you, but I need somebody that's a good shepherd. I need a good pastor. I need a good shepherd. I need Jesus. I need my pastor. I need Bishop to help me. Notice what the Bible says. Jesus has said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. He doesn't steal a rock from the sheep. He doesn't sleep with the sheep in the choir. He doesn't have babies all over the place. He doesn't go around marrying people that are not in the faith. This sheep, this shepherd doesn't do things like that. He is a good shepherd. Notice what he says. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. That's what the sheep, that shepherd would run. I ain't running nowhere. Jesus taught me, son, stand in the gap for the sheep. I don't care if you might say he's a small stature. David was a small stature. And David killed that Goliath. David killed that giant. So I'm standing in the gap as a good shepherd. Like my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is the good shepherd. And as an under shepherd, I'm standing in the gap. And I'm Fight any demon and devil that's trying to take every sheep out of the house of God in the name of Jesus. So notice what it says. He will do what? That false shepherd or that higher shepherd. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong unto him and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. Keep it going, sister. The higher head runs away because he's working only for what? Look at what it said, people of God. That false preacher or that false shepherd. Or that shepherd is not real. He's only working only for what? Money. He's only working for money and doesn't really care about the sheep. The devil is a liar. Ah, look at what Jesus says. He is the good shepherd. And I know my sheep. And they know me. How many can raise their hand and say, I know Jesus? In the name of Jesus. Just as my father knows me, I know the father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. Somebody should have shouted on that right there. That you understand that God sacrifices life for you, that God died for you, that God what bled for you, come on sister, come on brother, come on brother partner, you know that God died for you, you know what God did for your life, come on sister Jamela, you know what God did for you, don't you allow that devil to take it away from you, in the name of Jesus, somebody is still alive today, because of the blood of Jesus, somebody is still alive today, because of the blood of Jesus, go ahead sister, I know your story, so lay your hand up, Because you're not a sheep. Don't you understand? A sheep doesn't have a fight mechanism. A sheep cannot fight. A sheep cannot fight. I don't know about you, but I've never seen a sheep pull out his veins and be like, I'm going to bite you. You never see that. Why? Because they don't have a fighting mechanism. A sheep is easily led. Come on, sheep. Come on, sheep. Get on over here. They're not fighting. Who you talking to? They're not raising up with their hand on their hips. Who you talking to? I ain't trying to do that. No way. A sheep is easily led. But a goat would bite you all day. Goat, what you doing, goat? I don't like you telling me what I got to do. Don't you tell me I can stay over here and eat what I want. To eat. I don't want to go over there to that flock. I'm trying to do that. I'm staying over here. That's a goat. How many goats do we have this morning? Don't raise your hand. In the name of Jesus Christ. But before we end this place today, we need to all be sheep. Sheep, I'm talking about with white. With wool, running white. I'm talking about white. I'm talking about being blood washed. I'm talking about being blood washed. From the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. I'm a sheep. I can do it right now. Let me show you how the sheep praise God. That's how the sheep praise God. In the name of Jesus. And the days turn. We say hallelujah. Somebody open up your mouth and cry out hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Because you are a sheep. I'm not a poor up your hands up to that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because I understand. I understand this. That Egypt. 
I told you before that I teach, we teach here at New Life. We ain't just having good sermons when you got the plan, organ playing. And I got my hand on my ear talking about, eh, 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 shut up and all that mess. People need to hear the word of God. You understand what I'm saying? People need to read and know. That's why we got the screens. So that you can read the scripture in the name of Jesus Christ. And so when you think that, I taught you before, Egypt is symbolic of the world. Notice what I just said. That Egypt is symbolic of the world. When you look at Egypt, it's like looking at the world. What took place at Egypt? Think about Egypt as being like Las Vegas. You got the lights, you got the gambling, you got the girls, you got the prostitution, you got the sex, you got this, you got all of these things. So many things that people don't sleep at night. You got idols there. Idols, they worship idols, they worship this, they worship that. This is what Egypt is like, and it's symbolic of the world. And so those that are in Egypt, or those that are in the world, they do not like shepherds. They do not like pastors. And so when a pastor or a shepherd comes, they say, who is this? It's like being an abomination. So when people don't like pastors, real pastors is what I'm trying to tell you. Real preachers. When a preacher calls and say, hey, you got to be here in church. You cannot stay out there. Don't be staring out there going and doing this. Don't hook up with that person. Don't marry that person because they're not in the faith. They've not been baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't hook up and don't go there. Don't move over there because you're moving to somewhere that God is not telling you to go. You are in a good place. Don't go over there. You're hearing the word of God. This is what the world does. The world says, who are you talking to? I don't care about you, pastor. I don't care about shepherds. Why? Because of Egypt or oh, the worldly people don't like shepherds. Look at the Bible in Genesis chapter 46. Look at what the Bible says in verse 33 to 34. This is what happened talking about Joseph. Joseph was in Egypt. But Joseph told his brother Hey, when you move down here with us into Goshen by Egypt, don't tell Pharaoh. Pharaoh is a body of the devil. Don't tell Pharaoh that you are a shepherd. Don't tell Pharaoh that y'all are shepherds. Don't tell him your occupation is that you are a pastor. Because the world don't like pastors. The world don't like shepherds. But look at what the Bible says. And it shall come to pass when Pharaoh shall call you and shall say, what is your occupation? Look at what the Bible says to us. That ye shall say, thy servants trade. We are just traders. We trade have been about cattle from our youth until even until now. Both we and also our fathers. So all we do is trade in our family. Because notice what it says. That ye may dwell in the land of Goshen. So that you can dwell in the land of Canaan. So you can dwell in the land of Belgrade. So Pastor Garner, when you come down here, don't act like you that real preacher. The devil is alive. Don't preach that, Pastor Garner. The devil is alive. Don't tell them, Pastor Garner. Because they're going to get back. At you. I don't care. Tell your neighbor, I don't care. I know I don't care. Look at what the Bible says. Because look at what it says. But every shepherd is an abomination unto Egyptians. Every shepherd is an abomination unto Egyptians. So ministers, if you're here, ministers in training, guess what's going to happen? That devil don't want you to open up your mouth. Family members, the devil don't want you to preach this stuff. Don't want you to tell your mama that she needs to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Don't want you to tell your daddy that he got to go down in the name of Jesus. Don't want you to tell your wife, we got to walk up right, and we got to live right. Don't want you to tell your boyfriend, I can't be your girlfriend. Don't want you to tell your girlfriend, I can't be your boyfriend, because I got to live right. I got to marry somebody that's in the faith. I got to marry somebody that can lead to God. If you are a man, you got to be in the word and be submitted to the man of God, and to the word of God, and to God himself, in the name of Jesus. So what is it going to do? Keep your mouth shut. Don't tell them what your occupation is. Don't don't let them know that you are a worshiper. Don't let them know that you praise God. But how many can say today, I don't care what you got to say, devil. I am a worshiper. I am a praiser. I do give God the glory. And I'm not going to hold it back. Right now, somebody do it right now. Let that devil know you got the wrong one. You got the wrong one. You got the wrong one. I will praise God no matter what. In the name of Jesus. I will teach the word of God. No matter what. So not everyone will obey Jesus or listen to the good shepherd or take his diagnosis, which is the word of God. Because James chapter 1, verse 13 through 17, make it simple. Look at what it says. It's on the monitor. It says, I remember when you are being tempted, because people will try to say, well, you know, the devil is busy. You ever heard that before? And I tell people, no, you ain't. You busy. You're the one that's busy. And remember when ye are being tempted. 
Do not say, God is tempting me. When you go through things, do, get not, do not get mad at God. Say, God, why? Because it's not God that's doing it. He's not tempting you for you to give up and for your soul to be lost. God is never tempting to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes, notice what I'm about to say to God, read it. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. You want to know why you ain't coming to church? Because you are enticed by your own desires, and it's dragging you away. Take the diagnose, swallow it, get a water with it, and make sure it goes down so that you can be healed from the sickness today. These desires give birth. What happens? If I allow this, it gives desires, it gives birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to what? To death. Notice what the Bible says. So don't be what? Misled. Don't be mad at the preacher. I'm reading it just like you, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect, you say, well, he gave them to me. Uh-uh. Because whatever is good and perfect is a gift that comes down. Don't you call it and say that's a gift from God. Because that did not come down from God. God ain't giving it to you like that. You got to know how God operates. He ain't going to give you something when you're not ready for it. And I've always told the young people, if you can't control yourself, and I'm talking to the older as well, if you can't control yourself, God ain't gonna put nobody in the mix of it and give them to you. You got to know how to control yourself, which means you got to know how to be in the house of God, which means you don't have to, have to know how to live right. God ain't gonna hook you up with somebody, and yourself is already mixed up. He will wait for you to get you figured out, and get you fixed, and then he will begin to add, which is why the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added you got to go after God first before he begins to add to you. So whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from our God, our Father, who created all the lights in the heaven. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. That's why you say, when God did this for me, ah, uh, he doesn't change it. Jesus says, I am the Lord, and I change not. This is what God says in Malachi. I am the Lord, and I change it not. Look at what the Bible is saying. But I come to tell you, he chose to give birth to us by giving us the true word. And what? Look at what it says. And we, out of all his creation, became his prized possession. Somebody needs to get this thing this morning. Don't you understand that you are God's prized possession? You are God's prized possession. That means you are not something that's not on the side. But you are God's prized possession. When I look at my daughter, I say, that's my prized possession. When I look at my wife, I say, that's my baby. That's my prized possession. I love her so much. I love her so much much. That even some days throughout the day I'm thinking about my wife. I'm wondering what she's doing. I'm wondering what she's eating. I'm wondering what she's going. I wonder if she's sad. That's how God thinks about you. You are his prized possession. He wants to know how you're doing. He wants to know are you mad. He wants to know what's wrong, baby. He wants to know do you need anything. He wants to know are you sick. He wants to know what can I do for you. He wants to talk to you again. He wants to be in your presence. He wants to give you the wife that you have to have. He wants to give you the husband that you should have. He wants to give you the job that you know that you need so that you can still be in the house of God. He is your husband. You are his prized possession. But I don't think you understand it. That's why we take anything. But God says you belong to me. You're my prized possession. I'm just hoping that you need this. I'm hoping that somebody's getting this. I'm hoping somebody understands this. That you are God's prized possession. If you knew how much you loved you, you would not do the thing that you do. If you knew how much you love you, you would not stop you from coming to the house of God. If you knew how much you loved you, it will not take you out of the will of God. If you know how much you love you, you will break off with that relationship right now. If you know how much you love you, you will stop doing the things that you do if you understood that you are his prized possession. And when I became his prized possession, a change happened in my life. When I really understood that I was his prized possession, a change happened in my life. That's why you can pull up some old pictures of me. That's why I try to throw those pictures away. Because you can pull up some old pictures of me and you can 
say, that's you, uh-huh. That's you with that long cap, uh-huh. That's you with the braids. Now you're looking at me and say, he bald-headed. How you got some hair? He ain't got no hair, he bald-headed. But I used to have long hair with braids, people of God. But you can't see that today in the name of Jesus. You wouldn't want to see me like that. You wouldn't want to see me walk up on you. You wouldn't want me to see me. You don't want to see us. You don't want to see us is what I'm saying. So I'm so glad that there was a change that it came over me. I'm so glad there was a change. And you might be saying, but you think you all that? Uh-uh. I don't think that I'm all that. I just know that change is good. Which leads me to my second point. Notice what the Bible says. This is why I get excited. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, this is what I'm trying to tell you. I'm now in Christ, people of God. I'm now in Christ. So you cannot get me into that foolishness. When you are in that place, I'm trying to tell you God will bring you out of certain things. He'll make a change happen to your life. He'll make a drunk sober. He'll make a homosexual be turned straight. He'll make that girl that thinks she likes other women. He'll make her walk up right and say, ah, I love men. He'll make that little sissy boy that walk up right and be able to say, I am a man. I'm a man. I'm a man of God. That's why I come to tell you that the power of the Holy Ghost is real. You got to understand that the power of the Holy Ghost is real. I feel like preaching right now. You got to understand that the power of the Holy Ghost is real. Stop letting these false preachers make you think that it ain't really a change. Talking about they probably sleeping around too. Not this one. Come on, people of God. Not this one. You got to make say it. Not me. Say it, brother. Not me. Say it's just not me. I walk around and live right because I feel the God in the name of Jesus. That's why we need a real born again experience. Notice what John chapter 3. John chapter 3 verses 3 to 7. You want to know why you're still entangled? Because you have not been born again. You want to know why you're still fighting about the desires of your flesh? Because you really have not been born again. The Bible tells the people of God. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, truly, truly, I say unto thee, except the man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Hear what I just said. Unless you are born again, you're not going to be able to see the kingdom of God. That means you're not going there. Unless you're born again, you are not going to be able to see the kingdom of God. And people say, I know you get upset when you come to a real church. Because when you come to a real church, they will say this like this. Did you tell your pastor about me? Did you tell your pastor about me? The devil is a lie. Ain't nobody got to tell me anything. Because the Holy Ghost is real. Find out that the Holy Ghost is real for yourself. To be able to say, God, what do you want me to say? I spent all day in the morning. All in the morning. And all time over there praying, asking God. God, tell me exactly what to say that will touch the heart of the people. But notice what Nicodemus said. Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man be born when he is what? Old. That's why people don't understand the scripture. How can I be born again when I'm old? I'm about 45, 65, 85, 95. How am I going to be born again? Can he enter into the second time in his mother's womb? And be born? Notice what the Bible says, verse 5. Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born of the water and then of the spirit. Notice what I just said. Unless you be born of the water and of the spirit. So that means that the Bible, these preachers are saying, all you got to do is confess Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. And then you're saved. Who told you that? That is not scripture based no way. You cannot confess with your mouth and believe with your heart and all of a sudden, boom, some magic trick happens and you say, who told you that? Because Jesus just told us that we must be what? Born of the water. There it is right there. And of his spirit. That means you got to be baptized. That means baptism is a must. You got to be baptized and you got to be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then you'll be able to say, I can confess Jesus as my Lord and personal Savior. That's when you'll be able to say, he is my Lord. That's when you can say, he is my God. In the name of Jesus Christ. And so notice what it says in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't be shocked. Don't be marveled. Marvel not that I say unto thee that ye must be born again. Look at your neighbor and say, have you been born again? Ask them real quick and hold up and see what they say. Because tell them today is the day. Say congratulations, today is the day. Tell them right now. Look at them and say today is the day. The water is ready and the water is warm. It ain't cold. It ain't going to chill your body in the name of Jesus. And when you are born again and you take God's word, what will you be able to do? It says you will receive things clearly. 
clearly. You know the song. I see you clearly now. In the name of Jesus. You don't enter in strange relationships that are not of God when you have this thing born again experience. When you take in God's word. You don't go everywhere that the world goes. I know they might pop bottles. I know they might get their thing on. I know they might twerk it. I know they might do this. But I'm not doing that no way. In the name of Jesus. You don't want to listen to what the world is listening to. What would you say? Turn it off. Let's put on something else. Let's put on something else. You don't understand. And you know the Satan that God, that God is putting you in. You understand and know the Satan that God is putting you in. That's why the Bible shows us that we are a living. We're living in the last days, people of God. We're living in the last days. This thing is wrapping up. We get so caught up in the world things. What do we call up in marriage? We call up in marriage. And I understand marriage is good. We get caught up in jobs. We get caught up in promotions. I got to make this money. I got to get this relationship. I'm going to see what they're doing. I'm flying over here, going over here. I got to go do this and do that. And I got to get increased. And all of these things are people are good. I'm not telling you that we need to be poor. I'm not telling you that you got to be single. But I'm telling you, why don't you seek out the God first? Because the Bible says in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world? And what else? And lose his soul. So Paul breaks it down to us, people of God. This is what he breaks it down. And I got excited. We're getting ready to get out of here. Look at what it says. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21. Let's read it right there. Let's start at verse 21. Since you have heard about Jesus, how many can raise their hand and say, I heard about Jesus? Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him. That's why I love a church that preaches truth because they don't hold back and they don't care about people's faces and what they got to think. If you don't want to come back, I understand. I understand, but look at here. You will be able to say, I heard the truth. You will be able to say, I didn't told me I need to be baptized in the name of Jesus. You will hear the truth. And many people have come here, but they standing here today saying, you know what? I was one of those ones, but I'm back. And I got baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Look at what the Bible says, the truth that comes from him. Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, look at what it said. Let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitude. Somebody say, change my attitude, Lord. But put on your new creature, created to be like God, truly righteousness and holy. So stop telling lies. Tell your neighbors, stop lying. You know you're a liar. Stop telling lies. Stop saying if the Lord be the will If it be the will of the Lord I might come back tonight You know you ain't coming back tonight Stop lying in the house of the Lord But you need to be here anyway Let us tell our neighbors the truth For we are all parts of the same body And don't sin by letting anger control you Don't allow no anger to control you Because when anger control you Guess who's control you It is the devil that got you on straight So somebody needs to clip the strings Don't let the sun go down While you are still angry For anger gives foothold to the devil devil. That's why that devil is trying to get you angry. Because he's trying to get a foothold into your soul. He's trying to get a foothold into your life. That if he can get you mad at people, you will curse somebody out. And you will bring back that old man that died in that burial. In the name of Jesus. If you are a thief, stop stealing on your taxes. In the name of Jesus. Stop claiming those kids that are not yours. In the name of Jesus. It's quiet up in here. Somebody in here in Jesus' name. Lord, help us this morning. Help us this morning, Jesus. Help us this morning. Lord help us right now in the name of Jesus. I come to tell you, you won't pay it back. You may not know now, but you won't pay it back. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good work work in the name of Jesus and give. And then give generously to the others. It needs stop hoarding things. Stop hoarding these things. Don't use foul or abusive language. How many did that yesterday? Uh-uh. Don't do that. Let everything you say be good and so don't tell your children you ain't gonna never amount to nothing. Don't tell your children you get on my nerves. Don't tell your husband how you get on my nerves. Don't act like that to your spouse. You better love them and hug your back. Because I'm coming to tell you, you gonna get judged for that. When you start treating your spouse wrong, I don't know how I got right here. You start treating your spouse wrong, you are going to be judged for that. I just come to tell you, because we embarrass this more right now. In the name of Jesus. So that your words will be encouragement. So tell your wife and your husband right now. Now look at each other and say, baby, I love you. And those who are single, tell yourself, I love you too. In the name of Jesus Christ. And do, do, love, do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own and guarantee that you will be saved on the day of redemption. And watch what it says. And get rid of all bitterness. Somebody start just pulling it out of it. Get rid of all bitterness. How many of you are 
praise you tonight. I did. Stop getting that bitterness. I did. God know what mama did. I did. But don't be mad at mama. I did. That's why you got to say, Lord, forgive them. I did. For they know not what they do. I did. That's why you got to let that anger go. I did. Let that rage go. I did. Let them harsh words go. I did. Let that slander go. I did. Let them go what they did to you on your job. I did. Get rid of all of that bitterness. I did. Get rid of all of that junk. I did. Stop hoarding that stuff. I did. Break it over to ears and ears. I did. That's why your kids are caught up in it. I did. They angry and don't know why they angry. I did. That's why people that are prejudiced, I that you would say a white man that doesn't like a black man. I did. How are the kids learning it? I they were taught this. I, did. I don't want to teach my kids hatred. I, did. I don't want to keep them bitterness. I, did. I want them to say, listen, I did. your help comes from the Lord. I did. In verse 32, I did. instead be kind to each other. I did. Take your heart and I did. forgive one another. I did. Just as God wrote, I did. I did. who Christ has forgiven you. I did. So you might look, look, look to your left I did. and look to your right I and say, I forgive you. I did. In the name of Jesus, I did. In the name of Jesus, that's why I say, as pastors, we got to work hard. We got to do so much work. And I don't mind working. I don't mind trying to help. I don't mind teaching Bible studies. I don't mind doing it. I'll be the last one to leave this place if I have to. In the name of Jesus, I throw all of those things away. Everything that I'm hoarding on to, I got to throw it away. Which means it leads me to my last point. Here we go. My last point is this. Deliverance is available. Tell your neighbor it's available today if you want it. Deliverance is available, people of God. It is available. David talked to us in the Bible. He talked to us about the Bible in Israel in the wilderness. In Psalms 107 verse 6, it says, Then they cried unto the Lord. All you got to do is open up your mouth and cry unto God. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. And it delivered them out of their distress. That's why this is a man that I don't care about crying. I don't care about crying. I don't look at me. Can you look at me about crying? Because this is a man that will cry. Why? Because I'm trying to get my God's attention. I'm trying to get the Lord's attention. I'm trying to get my Father's attention. So I will cry. I will praise Him. I will go to my knees. I will ask Him. I will plead. I will say, Lord, help. I will say, Lord, Savior. I will say, Lord, bring them back. I will say, Lord, help that young man that's being taken out of here. He needs to stay. He needs to be back. I will cry. But we got to a place that nobody really wants to worship God. And nobody really has the emotion of you to really lift up their hands and cry out to God. But when you cry, people of God, then they cry up to the Lord in their trouble. You may not be in trouble, but I've been in trouble. And when you are in trouble, you will learn how to cry. You will learn how to open up your mouth. You will learn how to say, Lord, save me. I don't know about you, but how many need to be saved? How many need a change? How many need deliverance? It's available to you. Clap your hands right now to God. That's why God is waiting for us. He's waiting for us to cry out to him. He's waiting for you to recognize the wrong so that he can fix it. But we will tell like nothing is wrong. And we're closing here. We will say in the church, in the religious world, I'll say that, but not in the church of the living God. But in the world, in the religious world, we'll say stuff, I'm blessed, highly favored. And you have a smile to go with. But behind all of that gift wrap, you heard it. Behind all of that foolishness, behind all of that stuff you've hoarded over the years, you heard it. And when somebody starts taking the stuff out of the way to get to the hurt so we can see what's going on, we have a compulsive disorder. No, 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 touch that. Don't touch that. Don't touch that. Don't touch that. No, 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 don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me I gotta, I gotta let that go. No, 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 don't tell me that I gotta, I gotta let him go. No, 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 please, please, please. Can God work in another way though? No, 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 I need this. I need that. First John chapter 1 verses 9 and 10, this is my last verse. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive give us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, if you say I'm cool, if you say I'm all right, we make him a liar. I'm saying, you need God. 
You need a change. Some of you are tired. You're tired. But you just said, man, I just give up. I, I tried, but it ain't no way. You're tired. And his word is not in us. If you try to say that there's nothing wrong with you, why don't you turn it over to Jesus? Let him declutter your life. Let him get this thing out of your life. Because it is burying you alive. Let us stand. God to do something but if you want to hold on to it then no one can help you not even God but if you want to let it go if you know that it is a problem lay your burdens at the altar cast your cares upon the bed. his yoke is easy his burden is light In the name of Jesus. Somebody already has a desire to let it go. Somebody already has a desire to let go of that relationship. If you're struggling, God did not give that to you right now. If it was, they would already be saved in the house of the Lord. If it was God, they would already be baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. They would already be in the house of the Lord, not just at a church. If it was from God. So we're going to give it back to the devil. The devil gave it to you. I want you to give it back to him and say, I won't be needing this anymore. I won't be needing this anymore. In the name of Jesus. I won't be needing this anymore. In Jesus' name. Why don't we just lift up our hands today. And totally surrender. And let God empty out your life. Let him empty, empty out the clutter that is in your life. That has been on your heart. That you've been having on your mind. There's clutter. Things that happen in your life right now that you need God to let it go. God, I need it out. I need it out. I need it out. It is burying me alive. It's killing me. It's hurting me. God, it has me in a place that I know I want to give up. God, I need you to get this clutter. I'm hoarding on to these things. Daddy did something to me when I was young. And uncle did something behind closed doors. And, and mama didn't do anything to him. And, and mama said she was going to always be there. And mama left me in the name of Jesus. And, and grandma said she would teach me. But grandma ain't showing me. That church is what I need. That church is what I need. I need somebody to help me. God, help me to get cut. I got anger. I'm upset. 
I'm mad at God. I need you to help me. In the name of Jesus, let's lift up our hands right now. And we're going to all pray. Close your eyes right now. And talk to God right now. We're going to come around and lay hands. But I want you to think about God. God right now is looking up on you right now. He already died. He already paid the price. By his stripes you are healed. In the name of Jesus, God, I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus right now. Upon the hearts and the mind of the people. Father, at this altar this morning, some young lady, God, it is hurting to her heart. Some young lady wants to change. Right now, God, you said the Lord is available. So we trust you right now. Come on, the of God. Come on, my sister. The Lord is available. Leave it at this altar today. Leave it at this altar today. In the name of Jesus. Let it go in the day. In the name of Jesus. 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 The name of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus right now. In the name of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus. Touch God. Heal God. Deliver God. And set free. In the name of Jesus. Set free 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 in the name of Jesus. Thank you. 